Okay, here we go. So what I wanted to do today was really three things. And I want to engage your active participation in that because we're only going to be focusing on one chapter uh, today. So I want to begin to explore this larger question of the relationship between biblical hermeneutics and philosophical theology, which is sort of the title of the course, and to try to meditate on that between. So what I thought it would be interesting to do at the very beginning is to talk first about some of those differences in a way that allows us to slightly review some of the material we did last time for the first two chapters, because that sets up chapter three. Then we will utilize, and I want to talk about the differences of narrative or stylistic modes in the different cases, and how that helps us understand the spiritual theological issues in different ways. The second thing that I then want to do is to move more specifically to that problematic by reading chapter three more slowly with you after the first half hour of introduction more slowly to see precisely what the biblical hermeneutics of suffering and evil are so that one could see what that counterpoint is with the philosophical hermeneutics. In that context we can then talk about what uh, Nimmo raises, but I want to get at it from a slightly different point of view, is the experience of anxiety of Job. Because one of the things that he points out in a strong and interesting way, which ties in with my interest, is that the verbal expression of pain and suffering through anxiety is the core and the second order verbalization which we would call the philosophical reflection is really in a certain sense irrelevant or secondary to Job and if we only stay at that level we don't get to what's the core and his core is to deal with what does it mean to exist in the world when the foundation of the evident world has fallen apart and so that is much more primary in a certain sense than the critique against God. The friends come in and raise this as a God problem. But he begins with it as, a, as an existential problem of the crisis of his, of his world. And then I'd like us, towards the end, to come back to a much wider angle having done that, again to see the difference between biblical hermeneutics and philosophical theology, having gone through that patient phenomenological issue and see again what are the foundations for building some of the issues. In the first class, uh, the issue of foundationalism comes in. It's a, it, we want to see what are the foundations for rebuilding a religious life under those circumstances. So um, let us now first, uh, by means of reflection, for the first maybe 10, 15 minutes, I want you to engage thinking about those first two chapters. Um, what is the nature of the biblical hermeneutics? How does the style, what is the styles of writing and formulation in those first two chapters and how do they begin to articulate the problem? Now, the problem is not stated as an abstract philosophical or theological problem, the person enters the narrative world of the text. So that narrative world becomes the specificity of what we are talking about in terms of Job, right? And we want to stay with that. So um, let me he hear some just reflections on um, the kinds of narrative, things like that. What is the nature of the biblical hermeneutics that get us into this uh, framework? Anything that comes to your mind? And uh, then I'll maybe summarize at the end. Yes? Dramatic irony, as senseless as it all seems to Joe, we know that there's a uh, sort of a cosmic plan for what's going on. All right, so you're picking up on the issue 
of the relationship between what the reader knows and what the subject of the action knows. Okay? So that was one issue that we did talk about. Job is in the middle of the action, but we as readers of the action are given a privileged, omniscient view through the omniscient narrator that we are brought into two levels of the problem which already will open up a much larger notion of what I will call later a kind of metaphysical humility. The fact that there's an epistemological gap between what we can know and the narrator has created these two levels in which we can see something going on, but the crisis of the individual is that he can't know what's going on in the mysterious realm um, of fate or existence and so on. Let's go on a little bit more. So that's the relationship between the narrator and the reader. Uh, is there a more general view here that man cannot know what is going on in the deity? Okay, we're moving to, to the philosophical theology. Let's stay with the concreteness of the narrative first. I don't know if this Just make very simple issues. I don't know if this is an elementary school answer to your question, but, or if this is what you're getting at, but we're talking about, as far as literary genre is concerned, in the first two chapters, uh, so literary criticism, uh, genre criticism, it's, we've, got a, we've got some storytelling here. Okay, um, so what does that mean? What does uh, that mean? It means that... Um, um, so what do we mean by was, it's a story? Yeah, if this was a if this was reported as an historical document, it would seem that there wouldn't be before he finished talking, this guy shows up. Before he finished talking, this guy shows up. Before he finished talking, this guy shows up. It seems like it's a it appears to be um, a tale that is not necessarily grounded um, historically, but is more of a uh, a fable telling. All right, so you're trying to pin the nature of the narrative. But let's, let me stay with your point, just to make it a little bit sharper. Um, the narrator begins without saying that this is a revelation from God, nor does he say that it's inspired. He doesn't say that it's a fiction, but it's a human voice that is speaking. The human voice is speaking. So all of a sudden we're brought to a text that is describing something but that seems to be impossible to know. The same way the, um, the anonymous narrator of Genesis 1 is saying something that seems impossible to know. But tradition says maybe that's Moses with inspiration and so on and so forth. But the narrator tells us about things that we would not know. And it doesn't say God told me that this took place. Nor do we have any statement, I had a dream and I saw this in heaven. Right? That would have been a very typical biblical mode of having some kind of dream or a vision. And then there would be a certain veracity that would be implied by that frame. Having said that, we're aware that the narrator is not trying to give us a speculative treatise. He's giving us, as you're saying, some kind of a narrative that is creating a certain kind of theological situation. But it's stated as a human statement. The only time that God begin, will appear will be at the end when God comes out of the whirlwind and asks these impossible questions. And from the point of view of the writing of the narrator, this itself may be a theological fiction within this larger framework of a human narrative. Right? He then uses God as a voice for his purposes or her purposes the same way he uses all these other characters. Okay, so you have to just so the first issue that we want to bear in mind is that we we are thrown into narrative. We are thrown into a simple narrative. We are thrown into a narrative that has a certain kind of concreteness. We also have a narrative that's focused on personification. 
We don't have abstract philosophical or theological questions. Everything is centered around a person or a personification. Job becomes the central person. God is presented as a personality of some type, not altogether omniscient or a little bit off in his ego needs. The Satan becomes another kind of personification. Right. The personification, uh, the evil becomes an agency of the personification that's given the, to the Satan. Job and his wife become personae of the response to suffering. It's given a human voice. Okay? So from that point of view, we become very interested in how the narrative uses voice and the shifting of voices to begin to complicate the primary situation. The primary situation is simply an idyllic moment of this ideal figure Job, who is upright and pure and he turns from evil, he does nothing wrong and he's, he's uh, uh, um, doing all of this. Then, all of a sudden, he begins to speak that we begin to see a certain kind of ritual concern for anxiety. Perhaps my kids are not doing it right. So you see, our first hint of his subjectivity comes in through voice. So his first presentation is through a person of action and piety, and we begin to see an exemplification of that action and piety in narrative through his voice. Maybe they're not doing it right. right? The very first kind of worry, which we will only find out towards the end of chapter 3 when he says, you know, I was doing this and then the thing I really was worried about, pachat pachadati, I, I had this great anxiety via vodogas and there was this abyss that opened up in me. He, like, like there's some kind of anxiety. It's not all that firm. We have this first notion of some kind of a slippage by his voice. And then we again have the provocation of change in the voice of the Satan, the provocateur, right? Because now we see the first of the many cases of the role of questions. Right? First God says, have you seen my servant Job? Which becomes a kind of a rhetorical question, but then he says, does a Job do this for nothing? So for the first time we have another undermining of this man of action. What are his motivations? A motivation, so again we have this subtle movement into subjectivity. What are the subjective moments of a person of objective piety of action? He does everything right, but he's a little bit afraid that people are going to do something wrong. That's the first kind of chink in this kind of um, of this order. And then there is this notion hachinam. Does a person do things for no reason except that it's the right thing to do? Or does he have utilitarian motives? Right? And then the next time we have voice, of course, is the voice of the response to suffering. Right? His first two cases of naked from the womb and naked when he dies and God has given and taken and so on. What is the role? Now we have a shift from narrative. From we have narrative, we have dialogue, and now we have something that's close to a litany or some statement of piety. It's formulated quite differently. What seems to be the issue, because we're talking about these are the hermeneutics of the way this thing is setting itself up. What is that new kind of voice? when Job speaks. 
How would we characterize it? How is it different from the narrative voice or the dialogical voice? Yeah? It's addressed to a specific person. Are he speaking to his... Um, in the first case, it's not clearly speaking to his wife. He is, um, he is making a certain kind of proclamation. Right. In other words, we have, we have two moves. In a certain sense, the first voice, when he says, I came naked from the womb and God has given, and so on, praise be the name of the Lord, is his response to this in relationship to his own prior sense of being a pious person. In the second case, when it's his wife and she says, don't be a damn fool, curse God and die, just make an end of it, she becomes a metonym for all other kinds of social persons. The person who says, why are you doing this? That is, she becomes that first instance of that social world. In the first case, he's trying to respond in terms of his prior piety. Right? In the second case, she becomes that first person that is trying to question the nature of his piety. So still tell me, what, what does this religious litany do? How, does those, how do those two, those two statements, where do they stand in, as, as narrative voices? Because we're talking about the biblical, the hermeneutics of this, not the theological issues. Yeah? Is there a parallel between the conversation between God and Satan and uh, Job and his wife? In other words, Job starts out, the God starts out and says to Satan, look, uh, you do this and this will happen, and you can do that. Right. And his wife is saying, hey, do this and... Uh, All right, so we, you're, you're pointing out that we should be aware of these kinds of... Uh, parallels. Okay. I'm, I'm still trying to get at the difference between... You know, we, we have this kind of movement. I'm trying to get you to sense that we have this movement from a kind of objective narrative voice to a series of in, voices that disrupt this. And then, long before we get Job with his outburst, which we're going to talk about in chapter 3, we have Job speaking some kind of liturgical language. So what is that additional personified voice of liturgical language. What does the role of liturgical language here seem to do in the midst of this unfolding narrative? It's the yeah. traditional response that, that the religious leaders would give to suffer. It's, it's like the traditional official response. You think you think that uh, you you see you, you 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 think the narrator is trying to give us yeah. some kind okay right so when we are talking about what happens when the tradition breaks down or when you find that the tradition is not working for you anymore at this point this is still representing like I'm still in that he's still in he's still there he's yeah. still there yeah. <laughs> I'm particularly impressed by the fact that this is the opening, the first opening of his mouth from a situation of silence. Just like we're going to see the first, op the second opening of his mouth is when he will scream out, damn the day I was born. After the silence, uh, there's a parallelism between his first falling to the earth. That is, everything that's built up on the earth is broken down by falling to the earth into silence. And the first opening of the mouth, you are right, I think it's a liturgical mediation. But, and it's trying to hold together a religious world. But I'm struck by the fact of how primary it is. He still says, I was born and I died, God has given, God has taken away. In other words, it's he, he is as close as possible to this primal level of birth and death, which he had just experienced. And somehow he is 
holding on to a thread of spiritual world, but very close to this experience of birth and death. So, in a certain sense, we're struck, just as you're saying, in this way, there's something striking but odd when we'll take a look at chapter 3 from the point of view of biblical hermeneutics, that at the crisis point, he uses the, these kinds of balanced, a balanced litany. Okay? I was naked when I came from the earth, and I'll be naked when I go back. And it's, it's a kind of a juxtaposition. God has given and God has taken. Praise be the name of the Lord. In other words, there's a kind of almost clerical, liturgical formulation that while it's close to the raw nature of death and loss, it's counterpointed by that formalism that theology tries to give. That tries to stay close to crisis, but gives it this kind of public formal language. It's almost as if that's not yet his voice. That's what I'm trying to right? It's not yet his voice. His real voice will come after the second silence when he screams, damn it, I should be dead. I wish I was dead, so I don't have to feel the pain. He doesn't curse God and die. He curses his day of birth. Damn the day I was born. So I wouldn't have to have these feelings of pain. Right? So that's, yeah, go ahead. Um, you keep talking about his second outburst as that, the um, poetic, uh, I'm chapter three. Which we're going to be moving to, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what about, what about what he says to his wife? Where? But tell me, tell me what you have in mind. Well, so would you, would you put that as, is that considered a part of his first response because he's still... Well, he's tell me, still tell me. I, we're trying to think through this together. What, what, how does this work in terms of what I've been saying or don't you agree? Um, we're trying to get a sense of what does it mean to respond to crisis and then have a voice. When you dare to open your voice, right? Yeah, I, I guess what I'm thinking is, so the first response, all of these terrible things have happened and it hasn't affected his body, right? And then, and then, the, then he's struggling with the, disease, the fleshly disease and his wife comes to him and he's still, he's still a religious and pious man. But then it seems that there's a passing of time. And it seems to me that What's implied is that the passing of time is what changes his voice, um, that his true voice comes out. So I, I feel like I feel like in our conversation right now, there's just we haven't talked about that his first cry out is before he's aff afflicted in his body, but that he still cries out as a pious person once he's been afflicted. But then in chapter three. There's a different voice that comes out. I guess, does, does that make sense? I think you're saying something very helpful, and I want to uh, allude to something with N Nemo and see whether people pick up on that. Um, okay. One of the things that the narration of Job does is it's articulating in the background the fact that we live with an implicit narrative structure to our life, right? We live with a narrative structure to our life which we're not always conscious of until the crisis, where you have to kind of reset the narrative of your life. And what crisis does is it requires one to reconsider the implicit narrative. The narrative of Job's life was, you are right, articulated in terms of a form of temporality. But the temporality was the rhythm of ritual. He is a man of pious ritual. 
So in a certain sense, he only exists, he doesn't yet have full self-subjective consciousness. He is a person, there's a certain kind of critique, there's a kind of legal formalism of his action. I'm not using it in a pejorative sense, but he is, he is filled with the right ritual. He is upright and pure and he turns from evil. And those mark his temporal existence. And the fact that the ritual is yamim yamima, that it keeps coming around, right? The, the, tempo, the temporality is cyclical. He is in a ritual world in which his sense of time and space is dominated by his mentality of the ritual. So he's not yet thinking about the narrative fabric of life. He thinks of the ritual fabric of life. And even when he begins to think, and he has his first subjective response, it's a concern with the ritual fabric. Maybe they're not doing it right. So I can't trust my kids. They may mess up their life because it's important to do the ritual right. Yeah. To, just to kind of um, trouble what you're saying to see what happens. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fact of Job's anxiety at the beginning of the text, his concern that his sons do it right, does that not suggest um, that something more complicated is going on than a life structured by uh, ritual fabric for its own sake, right? Doesn't it suggest that maybe he's already worried, already struck by the contingency of blessing, and hence already suffering? Maybe. I agree. I agree. I think the genius of the narrator is that this is just, it's a semi-conscious thought. Okay. Right? In other words, the narrator is able to capture something in his unconscious, but he has to do it through a verbalization, because all of these things are verbalized. But in a certain sense, he's capturing that inner anxiety, which will keep coming out until he bursts out. And he says, everything I was afraid of at the end of chapter 3, it's happened. We now know that there is a deeper anxiety and we sort of see that on the surface, the power of religious ritual for this, what Berger called the sacred canopy, this social and ritual construction of reality that gives the world a narrative and spiritual coherence. That becomes the mise-en-scene, the kind of setting point spiritual and ritual coherence in which you think about doing the right action because you're convinced that those right actions keep the world in order. And so from this religious world point of view, there's really no difference between doing the sacrifices on an annual basis right and being a moral person. Those are all part of the duties He's a person of duty and responsibility. And part of that is to make sure that his kids do it because they're, in a certain sense, extensions of his personality. Right? And he wants to make sure that that works. So this, 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 these voices, so I'm struck, and I think you're absolutely right, but I think these levels in which things are present to consciousness, they have to be verbalized in this kind of folk narrative. But they only emerge to power gradually. So I'm struck by that first liturgical statement that praises God, that talks about something that on the one hand is so close to the core that he's aware of the fragility of existence and its tenuousness and that it can be taken away, but he does it in these very balanced lines of a liturgy. You hear liturgy here. You don't hear a personal voice 
as much as a liturgy. At least I don't. The first time we hear his own voice in a second we'll see is when he screams, damn it. I wish my mother's womb was my tomb. That's a human voice. Right? Right? So, and that comes after that huge great sound. Now, the point that, that Nemo makes in a very interesting way, he, um, I think it was when he, I, I, on the English, I don't know, um, but in, in the, the French is a little bit stronger, but it's at the point where he quotes um, um, uh, Lacan, um, and I think it's note five, but the issue that he's raising is that the evidence, the self-evidence of the world that we live in has coherence by the narrative we use. We have an implied narrative. And therefore, when he quoted the psychiatrist who gave the radio talk, he said, if you only had a new language, you could leap over the crisis. Right? So part of what's happening with chapter 3 is that it absolutely ruptures the sequence of sentences that follow as prose sentences that, break, that are the sign of the orderly world. When you shift to poetry and broken lines, you have broken that sequence. Now that's why that litany is this middle point. It has the kind of balanced line. This is the biblical hermeneutics of it. It has the balanced line of narrative coherence. But it's beginning to have that poetic shape that has a different breathing rhythm. Right? I'm trying to just help you see that deeper than the level of your reading, when we talk about the difference between biblical hermeneutics and the abstract philosophical theology that we're going to be talking about, which is kind of raising this to a much larger, impersonal form, our first reading is to breathe with the normal syntax of the sentence. Right? So you're breathing in logical sequences. Right? That's part of the power of the narrative. Each sentence has a coherence. It ends. The next sentence. That's part of the coherence of life, of the narrative that works. When that is fissured and broken for the first time in his two lit litanies or ritual, they are broken up into poetic lines. So we have the first sensation of the rupture of breath which is part of the rupture of crisis now it still has the balancing God has done this, God has given and God has taken I, die, I come naked and I die naked it has this kind of balance, it's still, he's still working on balance but the balance is ruptured in the middle because the senses are interrupted by a breath. You don't read those two lines as one statement, or else you, you'd screw it. You'd screw it up. So there is the implied sense of a haltingness of breath that makes you pause and become aware of the hermeneutical statement that you just made. You can't j just say it as, or you could, if you did it every single day. But when you do it in crisis, you have, can I say this? Right? Can I say, praise be the name of the Lord when my children have died? So I have to hesitate. And that hesitation is still, he's still being pious, so we have the balanced lines but there's a hesitation. And that hesitation is magnified in the hermeneutics of his outburst 
which has all of the sobbing rhythm of the broken line. Or the hyperventilation of anxiety. So he keeps repeating it, and he keeps saying it, and then he goes back. It has a kind of more hyperventilated quality. Now I say all that is because this is helping us, or at least it's helping me, try to get a sense of the movement from a narrative world to the world of anxiety. And how biblical hermeneutics is doing that. It's very different if I say abstractly, we're going to deal with the situation of a person who lives an upright life and what, is, what happens in crisis, etc., etc. And as we talk about this, and we try to move from the specific case of a person and the personification to some abstract statements. And I move from the particular case of this person in this time to something that tells me something about the nature of human existential life. Now, there's going to be, there has to be a tension of moving back and forth. Because in a certain sense, I'm already, I'm already mediating between biblical hermeneutics and philosophical theology. Am I not? Because I wouldn't have any language to talk about. Every time I'm glossing the biblical text, I'm using a second-order language. Right? So the question that I'm raising, I think, but then there's a difference... If I was just a naive first order reader, I would just be caught in that and I wouldn't have, I would be fundamental, reading it fundamentalistically, I wouldn't have a second language. That language is the only language I have. That determines how I think. If I only had the abstract language, I would in a certain sense be some kind of a vapor, thinking about the world and not about real life and death. So I'm having to try to move back and forth so that reflective language sharpens the biblical language, the biblical language concretizes my thinking in a, more, in a larger sense. Now that could also break down, that's why we're talking, and I'm trying to uh, get your sense of these. So let me make one more statement then before we turn to the... Um, So we have, we're going to be moving towards poetic verse and metaphor from a kind of mythic narrative scene. And the mythic and the metaphor will be condensations of inner experience. Right? In a very specific way. I want to add one further thing as we move towards chapter 3 and then have your questions or, or comments before we do that. At the beginning, and this comes back to issues that you raised too, and um, at the beginning, temporality, our experience of our, mor- of our mortal life is governed by the rhythms of ritual. Right? We, we really work to create rituals which give a kind of repetitive order to existence. The brokenness gets factored away by the harmony of ritual. That's a great power of ritual. But we're also seeing where it has certain kinds of ways that it tries to... It's the bridge over the river Kwai, right? It's just that you don't, you're holding on <laughs> to your life as you're crossing. So the first type of temporality that you're brought into as a child is the rhythm of the family and the rhythm of ritual. And that, that becomes that first sense of security of what it means to walk through existence. Okay? From 
the beginning with the narrative of the Satan, we have a totally different situation. Temporality is marked by pain. Precisely what was trying to be avoided at the beginning. That we mark our life by increases or decreases of pain and suffering. So here, I just bring, throw to your attention the great phrase of Susan Sontag's great book, Illness as Metaphor. Right? Illness as Metaphor. Illness as Metaphor for the fragility of life, for the way we see one another, the attempt not to see, Nemo makes this, I think, I think his most brilliant point in that first chapter is that he claims that when the friends see the outrageous bodily decay on Job's body, they, in a certain paradoxical sense, can't relate to him anymore as a human being. And they take this as a sign that he must, of their worldview, that he must be suffering for a reason. Or he wouldn't have this outrageous pain. What if they saw that pain as something that they too could have? And then they would have related to him as a person. They, in a certain sense, can't make that leap to his pain and his suffering because then they would simply be with him in his suffering. So what they do is they say there must be a reason for this because it's so much more than what we have. And they can't allow themselves to think that that is the fate of any person who could have a developmental illness, right? And that that illness is presented in this heightened way. But my point so far at this point is simply to state that we have a movement that temporality is marked by pain and the rhythms of pain and the hearing of the report of messengers. Because these messengers now are the sign of the temporality. What, only I am left to tell the tale. Only I am a survivor and I'm coming to tell you. Right? It's narrated. It's spoken. And the narration now is the narration of death and suffering. So you have that narrative within the narrative. <clears throat> and that narrative is the narrative. And it's a whole different temporality. So from that point of view, this caesura or this rupture is the rupture in the narrative coherence that, that a world makes sense and that that world will remain absolutely silent to Job. The world will never talk back to Job. His friends are going to try to give explanations. And then God is going to say something else towards the end. So before we turn to chapter 3, anybody want to make some further reflections on this relationship between biblical hermeneutics and philosophical theology just from this point of view of rituals the change when time is marked not by ritual but by pain and the narratives of pain or the attempt to create liturgical language that bridges over the pain. All these are very powerful things. And the narrator has given us this incredible spectrum, hasn't he? Of what it means to be a human being 
in this um, form. Um, until ultimately, all speech breaks down at the end when the friends have to sit in silence. Right? That becomes this new watershed moment. The, the horror. And I'm struck by the fact that the horror is not just Job looking inward or his wife being a nearby provocation. But the friends represent the social world. So they represent the true horror seen from the outside. Right? It's now seen, it's not just experience. So that that presence to the gaze perhaps is one of the things that makes Job move so deeply inward to scream. Because we're wondering, what is going on that is making that transition? Is it just that he doesn't sin with his lips and then he does speak out? Or is it feeling the gaze of horror that makes him even more deeply aware of the monstrosity of what's happened to his life. Anybody have some thoughts before we move to chapter three? Anything, on anything that we've been saying? Yeah? Um, it seems to me that we are getting, um, that Job has a rupture in his life that is causing him to look at the divinity in a different way. And the ritual is failing uh, to answer that question. That in Job, the response about to see in chapter 3, uh, he is dealing with a fact of a God that he didn't realize. But he won't talk about God yet in chapter 3. Yeah. He doesn't talk about God in chapter 3. Or his condition. He just says, damn the day I was born. Yeah. It's The move to theology comes with the friends. Right? If the first response of Job in this case, and that's the big difference between him and the liturgy, he is now facing himself as an absolutely mortal being. And he's trying to erase pain. But isn't in the context of the friends? And isn't Job a threat to the friends? Well, they are, but we have, that's what I'm trying to, that was the suggestion I was making that there, he's a threat to them because he indicates that there's something, it's not just normal suffering, living and dying. There are, are outrageous experiences that are expressed on his body. That's why it's externalized on his body. It's not just a psychological suffering. They see that and it's a greater sign of something monstrous about existence. So they are a threat. He's a threat to them and the way that they are going to see the world. And it's perhaps when he internalizes that, he has to scream. Um, I wonder, as uh, this is just my thoughts about the, the move that we're making from um, uh, kind of a liturgical life to uh, um, from from the narrative, the narrative ideal world, the mm-hmm. world of anxiety. Um, and I wonder if that, that has to do with the inability to practice and inability um, to perform the custom. I, um, I read Heschel's Sabbath this summer, and he talked a little bit in the book about uh, one of the things holding many of the Jews during the Holocaust was this, that they still found the Sabbath as a respite despite their suffering. And Job, what's interesting about Job is um, that he has this custom for his sons. His sons would hold feast days, and the text tells us this, and that he would provide um, 
offerings for them. So we don't have a prescribed, this is done on this day. We don't have a prescription at all of what that custom looks like. We just have in the text that there was customs that were going on with his family. And then all of a sudden, he's afflicted so much that he can't move, that he just sits. And it says, the text tells us that his friends come and they sit with him for just seven days and seven nights. And so we know that at least there was a week that went by that no liturgical custom was kept. There was, there was nothing, nice, nice, nice. nothing that happens, right? And so I, I wonder just about the effect of actually physically being able to practice a custom and what that does psychologically. Now I know I'm not, I'm not trying to be um, anachronistic is not the word I'm looking for. I'm not trying to bring um, like my like understanding of like religious custom or Christian custom or Jewish custom to this text. All that I'm saying is we know that there was a full week that goes by that you that Job is not able to practice. And I, I just wonder about the effects of the physical practice on the psyche for Job and how that affects what we're going to read in Job three. I think it's a strong point and I think you just hear it. I think you just have to hear it. The only thing that I was also hearing as you were saying that, and it's not a response to that, it's just another hearing. Because I think that we just have to hear that. That may be, that may, you know, it's something that we have to bear, bear it in mind. Is, and I was struck by when you're talking about the Sabbath. Now, one of the things that rituals do is they provide a certain kind of coherence and repose. It's a coherence and repose. The suffering is what the text will call rogues, absolute anxiety. And this, this interstitial time of sitting without ritual is the negative side of the anxiety. It's not the repose. It's a resting point, but it's interstitial. It has the negative side to it, right? Right? It has that negative side to it. Um, and so I think it's in that context that your point is strong, that the normal sense of ritual is that it gives not just coherence, but it gives some kind of mental rest. Right? There is a kind of deep spiritual repose that ritual gives. And this caesar and the crisis and the falling on the ground into silence is, is infected by the anxiety of the suffer- and the pain of the suffering. So that this is not rest. It is a kind of negative form. It's an interstitial time that's infected by the pain. Right? So, for me, that's part of that dialectic. So I would just add that to what you're, you're saying. Um, because part of what we're trying to get at at each moment is how does a person rebuild their life with, self, with consciousness? My feeling is that the narrator has captured something psychologically brilliant in terms of religious psychology. That when Job speaks liturgically at the first two moments, he hasn't really gone to ground zero. He's come close to the primal because he talks about some primal things but he is still using someone else's language. It's still the language of ritual. And the beginning of chapter three is the beginning of trying to respond to the world. 
And so the first moment, this statement, I wish I was dead and didn't experience pain, is the true first honest statement. He's not building up a world of coherence. He's not yet giving more, he's not giving explanations. He's not thinking. He's not giving abstract conceptions. He is wishing for not death so much as the extinction of pain. Um, this is maybe just going more off that point, but um, it seems to me that we're talking a lot about how the liturg- liturgical and the ritual is creating, is kind of breaking down at this point, and then that we're getting to something more like almost deeper, but it almost seems that it's a necessary step. Like it's creating a certain amount of space for, a, for like it, it has the reflection has to come almost within the space of uh, at least trying the, the normal liturgical ritualistic um, modes of life before it, this this other level can even happen. Like I'm not sure you could quickly like get around that. It's creating. I think you're making a very lovely point because you're saying that. Even when we're trying to identify with the narrative so that we can enter into the biblical hermeneutics of suffering, the narrator has moved us slowly into the crisis. Right? He's, and I think that's... Uh, is that, am I, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think that, that we're not going to be able to see that we're getting to something deeper, that we're getting to something more based on experience, that, that, that the, the ritual, that the liturgy is not going to work until we have seen that that has been attempted and that there's a space for something else to happen, I guess. Like, it's like it's got to be almost contrasted mm-hmm. against mm-hmm. it. Anybody else want to pick up on some of these thoughts? Yeah. Uh, when, when reading about the, the silence, the seven days, my first thought was that it was some kind of sitting Shabbat that his friends were so struck by what had happened to him and his bodily decay and the, the horror of it that they set Shabbat for him while he was still alive. But that's... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's a kind of... It's a nice point. It's a nice point. In other words, there's a kind of prolepsis of his death wish. Yeah. yeah. They are mourning for the life that has been lost in Job. And he perceives that, perhaps. So they're proleptically and talking of his death. He may perceive that, and then he, then he speaks, I wish I was dead. I wish I was really, really dead. Really dead. Right? Something like that, maybe. And that's why he says what he says. Right? Because it's... It's the real counterpoint, isn't it, to what he had said with even his pious statement. I came naked from my mother's womb, and I'll return naked there, not to the womb, but to death. He doesn't want to even come out of the womb. In other words, there is an undermining of that liturgical statement. I want, I wish I was stillborn. That's what he says. My head never came, breached the womb to see light. That the womb was a tomb of darkness. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in relationship to Genesis 1 in a second. Because in terms of biblical hermeneutics, we're going to see how the writer has undermined that text. Right? How has... Um, what happened to the Job that we saw in the Kierkegaard situation... But that was the Job who is still speaking liturgical phrases. Right? Kierkegaard has lifted that out to be an eternal existential model. But the book of Job moves forward. Right? Kierkegaard has lifted that up to be a model of what you could say about gratitude and suffering. So he took this and he lifted this up 
now as a philosophical theological statement. It is a concrete statement. He lifts it up out of the narrative so that you can be instructed by that fragment of the narrative in your life. So what he's done for all the greatness of that essay is he's taken the concreteness of biblical hermeneutics and turned it into philosophical theology. Because he's lifted it up and says, now you can put this in your wallet as a little thing that you can have to remember gratitude. Write it on the doorposts of your house and on your gates and make it as frontlets between your eyes so that you can know that you have to have gratitude at all times, even when you have suffering. So he's moved it from that concreteness to something else. But the narrative, but the text of Job had, didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. It gets more and more concrete. It brackets the phenomenology of theology. It just stays in the concreteness. Yeah, please. Moving, moving in a slightly different direction on like the philosophical theology side, you mentioned that uh, that Job's friends didn't couldn't fully relate because they didn't see that as a possible condition. Um, in what way does that uh, sort of relate? I I guess the difference I get is 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 a, for me that brings up the idea of some sort of redemptive suffering that one can only relate or, or, or no beauty or good once you've gone through, gone through something bad or a horrific. So what's the redemptive suffering now? Is there any redemptive suffering that you see yet? We're not at the end of the book and I'm not even sure that those right. Christian categories are going to work. Right. They may work for you at the end of the book. Right. But that would be to think as a Christian perhaps. Or maybe Simone Weil will talk about redemptive suffering. But that's already a category. Let's not yet get to that category and see if we can go to Job and then you can integrate that back into your religious life, well then maybe it'll work. But, no, no. but I, what is redemptive yet? You tell me. Am I missing something? No. Um, the confrontation with suffering itself. I mean, it it's, is the thing itself. Yeah. It is this turning into suffering. Yeah. In other words, suffering has taken over his entire personality. That's a point I think also that Nemo makes, right? He says it's not all this stuff going on in the air with ideas. He is suffering. There's no gap between Job and suffering. That is something astonishing. In other words, and I think that's what he is, what Nemo is also meaning when, let me just make this and then I want you to jump in, when he uses this sense of angoise, this kind of anxiety. Right? Why? Like he's hinting at Heideggerian things, but we don't have to go there. I'm just trying to think this way, because we're not about redemptive suffering. What if you allowed that, those thoughts, to fill your entire consciousness of the anxiety of existence? Not as a thought. Not as thought. And not even as Heideggerian disposition. But that it fills, the anxiety fills you with anxiety. Right? You are nothing but the anxious notion that life has no stability. That it could happen at any moment. In other words, you have internalized everything that's gone on. It, I'm a messenger. I came. I'm telling. I'm telling. I'm telling. It's not just narrative. Now, what if you now internalize that entire narrative? And I'm asking you to do something very different. Now, take it all in. Take that entire narrative in. 
Not reading it with your eyes and hearing it with your ears. Take it all in and say, God Almighty, that's, that's my life. I don't, I don't, I love and it can explode. I do this and it can explode. I have health and it explodes. And I live in that consciousness. Right? Now at the beginning, it's as if Job says, I can't bear to go to that existential depth. Right? That is the crisis of the beginning of chapter 3. That we're not at any philosophical, theological level. It's not idea. We're mortal. Life is fragile. Right. Those are the best terms. Now, it's in, your, it's in your gut. It's in your head. It's in your body. It's expressed through the boils, and you're scraping it. And you can't scrape it enough. Now, his body is that eruption of the fullness of that anxiety. That's what, that's what Job is on that dung heap. Life is just a pile of crap. And he's sitting there. And it is ex- exuding through his body. And he's feeling it. And he can't stay with that thought. Right? He can't stay with that thought, and the friends can't say either. Now that is, that is, we might say, the deepest existential anxiety. It's not, I'm, there's no separation between me and that and thought. The entirety of the fragility of life is expressed in me in every single moment. And so can I go on? Can I make a Heideggerian leap and say, I'm going to live with the sense of limitation. I'm going to live with the sense of of knowing mortality. That's already a thought that is then reincorporated into consciousness, isn't it? I've taken that notion and turned it into a philosophical idea that becomes an internal guidepost for me to think about my everyday life. I'm, I know that I'm on my way to death. That I'm, the moment I'm born, I'm dying. But that is a thought, isn't it? And that is very, it's very powerful, and that may be, that may be a certain way that one has to, could live. But this is something more raw. This is more raw. He has not yet got to that point. He is, that is now what suffering is. That you are your suffering. You are your suffering. And all that it means in terms of the warp of existence is just a warp. And it's expressed through your body. I think that's the point. So all you can say, the most you can say is, I wish I was dead. I can't stand the pain. Right? He does, he's not suicidal. Right? He, he doesn't have that space yet. He just wishes he had no pain, no consciousness. Because all he is is the consciousness of pain. Any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's incredible how your comments and your take on this really helps um, help me understand uh, Siddhartha Gautama, right? I mean, the experience of Siddhartha when he goes out of the palace, the story, right? And right, right. He sees the person dying. Everybody, we talk about Siddhartha and, and maybe mention it to other people who might. Yeah, uh, is, the, is this a narrative? Story. Louder, louder. Just, so everybody may not know this. With this Hesse's famous novel, Siddhartha, and so Gautama yeah, but, Buddha. But, but yeah, yeah, the story of Gautama Buddha, right, the prince Siddhartha, he grows up in this palace, isolated from the real world, and he goes out and sees suffering, he sees someone dying, and he comes back and uh, he ends up leaving the palace, 
but the question is, why does he have to leave? Why didn't he just write him a check and say, okay, you're poor, you suffer. <laughs> why does he have to... And, and the, the answer in light of this is that he internalizes in this, and he realizes that the sick person is himself, that the dying person in himself, and he doesn't realize that on the spot. It, it, this, this is the progression. It takes this... Uh, uh, process of realizing that it is him, and that uh, right, and when you have the four noble truths of, of Buddhism, right, 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 right. That, that life is suffering. What does that mean to say life is suffering, right? And uh, I think the, the job helps us understand <laughs> Siddhartha yeah. Gautama in a way, right? Right, right, right? You reach that point that, that suffering is not something you relate to. Well, what does it mean to be witness to suffering? It, it, it is you, in fact. It is, in fact, radically you. If you spot. can, if you can, if you can, if you can do it. In other words, here we see, yeah. yeah. But in a certain sense, we see that there is a primordial eruption if you allow that to take over your body, yeah. right? And we already sense in the language that the friends are going to emerge all the psychological defenses. Right? In a certain sense, the, the friends will shift the level to all kinds of theological, ideological, psychological defenses against that pain. They may be right, but it's a different order of experience and language. So, if you haven't ever read Hermann Hesse's great Siddhartha, please. Yeah, but it is one of the great novels ever written. Yeah, yeah. Except for for Narcissus and Goldman, except for the glass bead factor. The bead factor. <laughs> you have to read all of Hart's, uh, yeah. Hesse's stuff. And his poetry. You know. Yeah, yeah. In the Narcissus and Goldman, he deals with that in terms of the rationalist and the person who suffers during the Black Plague. But, uh, the interesting thing about what you're saying here, and I, maybe it'll be something that we can come back to, and one of the things that actually made the deepest impression on me when I was your age and I first read it um, many times, but um, it was sort of a thing to do in the 60s, right? <laughs> but, no, but um, not every... But the... Um, you have to go through stages right, to, to find wisdom. Wisdom is achieved <coughs> incrementally. And there are way, and you have to move through adolescence to building a family, to raising kids, to see death, and sickness, and suffering, etc., etc., and then you move into older age, into aloneness. Right? And he has a certain kind of Buddhist progression, but it's very powerful. And there's also going to be, as we will see, a certain kind of incremental change as we go through the Book of Job. You can't get to the end and rebuild your life until you have gone through a whole series of other mental changes. So there's a whole, the, the narrative itself is a ritual psychological drama that will take us through stages. But your point, uh, Adrian, is very powerful that um, these issues of becoming the suffering but it's not, but it's the suffering of all things that you can bear inside you. Because he's not, it's not just I, Job, have, it's, the, it's all that death of other people too that now is internalized into him. That's a great, powerful thing, but it's too hard to bear. So let's take a look at chapter 3 um, and see a little bit. Um, 
We'll be collecting that, and I'll get, make sure you get a... Yeah. So let's turn to chapter 3. And what I want to do now is to come back to these issues of biblical hermeneutics through this particular text. Now, the transition I want to just say is, I want to just point out two phrases once again in chapters 1 and 2, just as we move to chapter 3. It just struck me again last night thinking about it. At the very end of chapter 1, verse 22, after all that takes place in that first round, the text says, Bechol despite all of this, right? Despite all of this, Job didn't sin, and he didn't speak disparagingly of God. And then at the end of chapter 2, the last half phrase of verse 10, Becholzot, despite all of this, all of this notwithstanding, Job didn't sin with his mouth, his lips. And then this astonishing statement that then appears in verse 1 of chapter 3. Acharei chen. After all of this, after this, he opens his mouth and curses his day. Now, this, I'm going to, I want to go through these issues, but we are now see that his day is a metonym. It's the day of his birth, as we will see. But it is the term for mortal existence, for daily mortal existence, one's day alluding back to the various times already in chapter 1, right? Verse 6, and it was on that day, right? Or that he used to do this yamim yamima, daily, yearly, okay? He curses his day, he curses the day of his birth, but he's cursing the days of his life. He's cursing all of the rituals and forms. You have to get the full force of what it means to talk about one lives in a day. To have a day. Right? This is a real big notion. My day. To have a day. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. It's not just a kind of something abstract. So now... Um, let's, let's read um, through verse 13 first. I'll, I mean, someone want to read this in English in any translation just so that we have it again in front of us and I want to make some comments. Who would like to read? Anybody? Yes, please. This is the NIV translation. Pardon? This is the NIV. But... Anything. Any, use your translation and just listen with your ears at the revised version. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish. And but notice that that text is glossing, because the text is much simpler. It says he cursed his day. May the day upon which I was born be blotted out. It's, but it's highlighting day. Okay, I'm sorry. But I just want you to be aware that that translation is now folding that into this, but the reader hears day, day, day. It's explicating the day that he cursed. The narrator says this, and this is now Job speaking about that. Okay. May the day of my birth uh, perish, and the night that said, a boy is conceived. That day may turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. 
May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. That night, may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be bare. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. Those who are ready to rouse le levithai. May its morning stars become dark. May it wait for daylight in vain. And do not see the first rays of dawn. For it did not shut the doors of the womb on me to hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were the knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep and at rest. Okay, let's stop at that point. So we're now entering into the biblical hermeneutics of the screen. The screen. I remember years ago, um, <coughs> um, I was at a conference, it was a long time ago, and I was talking about the paper that I was giving was on Job 20, which has subsequently been incorporated in, in one of an early book I did, Text and Texture. Um, and I was, I was talking about a thing of pain, a mere belly, and Job and Jeremiah cursing the day of his birth. We'll look at this in a second. And we were reading, discussing that whole rhythm of the liturgy of Jeremiah cursing the day of his birth because of the pain, the magor misaviv, the anxiety that was all around him by the threat of his friends. Right? And the person who was with me at that time, a friend of mine, I don't know if the name Jeffrey Hartman means anything to you, a literary critic, um, I guess maybe no longer, but he was a great literary critic. He's still alive at Yale. And he made an intervention that was so powerful to me that bears on this. And he said, this is not the way, this is not the genre of prophets. Prophets don't get up and speak in parallel lines with fancy language. The true genre of a prophet is to screech outrage. Their disciples can be formulated, but prophets don't talk that way. So I want you to keep that in mind when you're looking at this. Job screeches. And now we have a poetic reformulation of that that tries to stay as close <coughs> to the pain of outrage as possible. But it's not the scream of pure outrage. Right? It's not a primal scream. The primal scream precedes this, right? And you have to remember that when you're reading this. This is trying to approximate a primal scream in a way that will work for this great work of poetry. But it's not what you do when you tear your hair up, when you scream and sob. You only say it once and you wail. But the poet is trying to get us to this um, feeling. And the jarring breath units bring us to this 
level of multiple screams and sobs and gasps, at least the way I would read this. It's not the sob and the gasp, but it's trying to help you feel the sob and the gasp. Because this is still already a second-order language of poetry. This is not the scream of suffering. It, but it's so much more than what we'd seen before, isn't it? So, what impresses you about this form? What, what are the features of it that struck you? How did you, I want to hear from you a little bit before I say some more. What are the thematics? What are the terms? What? Anybody want to pick up on anything here? The imagery is all really bodily or nature. Um, so I guess that would go back to your theme of it being very concrete. Okay. All right, so that's one of the things we want to be aware of in terms of the biblical hermeneutics. Yeah. And there's a certain level of originalness to like to like the response, right? He can he continues he continues to say may over and over, may the bloom, uh, may God, may no shine. So this there's the repetition of of of, of the word may sort of stands out. Um I think that that, I understand what you're saying, I think that that may be, turn your, I think the translation turns your head around the wrong way. I think closer to the Hebrew is let, it's a curse, it's a cursing language. And what's interesting here is how he is trying to reverse there are two things. He's trying to reverse and undermine the creation. And he does so by going after the very first aspect of the created world in Genesis 1, the creation of light. God says, let there be light, yehi or. And the first thing that Job says in verse 4 is Yehi Choshech, let there be darkness. From the point of view of biblical hermeneutics, of hearing that, one has to hear the subversion of the world. That he is speaking the curse to undermine God's speech. The biblical hermeneutics is a subversive speech. It's a subversive undermining of God's speech by a human being. God damn the day I was born. Let it be dark. And then the womb will be the tomb. And he peats darkness, darkness, cursing the day, darkness, <coughs> over and over again. The day, the night that says a son, a child has been born. Let that day be dark. God can't even find it. Right? Darkness, gloom. Again, the night. Let it not be joined to the days of the year. Let it be, again, yehi. Let it be sorrowful. Let there be no joy. stars are cursed. 
the day, the night, the sun. Wombs are cursed. And that the womb would have protected him from the amal in verse 10, that he would not have to engage the turmoil of life. Nimmo uses some French translations which he talks about as amal as anxiety. It's a term that's going to come back later on in Job. It's going to appear frequently in Ecclesiastes. It means the labor, the burden, the all that all the weightiness and turmoil of existence. Right? And then the question, why didn't I die in the womb? Why didn't I die before I came out of my mother's womb? That the knees would receive me or that breast would give me suck. Because if I didn't, now I would have rest and be quiet. I would sleep. And things would be calm. Right? That's the counterpoint. So the first aspect of thinking about Biblical hermeneutics is to see particular phrases that are now being used as a subversive speech of the higher theology. Because what does light do? What is the symbolism of light? Why is the first, why is the first thing that God creates is light? This is a question that Herder raised already in his famous essay in the 18th century about poetry and theology. Why, why is light at the beginning? What is there about light? Light reveals. Light reveals. What else does light do? Light illuminates. Illuminates. You see distinctions. You can have relations. Things emerge in the light. You make discriminations in the light. With light you can have day and night. With light you have time. With light, I can see the difference between a tree and the grass. Right? With darkness, I don't. With light, I have anxiety. With darkness, I don't. But he doesn't want a diurnal rhythm. And there was evening, and there was morning, and there was evening, and there was morning. That is an order to life. There was evening and there is morning. I wake up in the morning and maybe it's a new day. Maybe there's new possibility. I can say my prayers and maybe start in a new way. I can see the sun. Maybe it's not what it was at night. But Job wants all night. He wants darkness. Because that's the sign of the extinction of day. The extinction of pain. We're going to come back to this issue, but we're going to see. Where do you, what are the fundamentals that you build on? 
if Genesis 1 is right, or it's right from a certain hermeneutical perspective in Scripture, it presents a certain fundamental grounding of the order of things. Right? There's a sequence to days. There's a sequence to creation, and it's called good. How would you know it's good? God says it's good. Right? Would you see it as good if you didn't have God's word alongside that? So the text is saying, this rhythm, this order, it's good. Can you see it? And Job says, I don't see it. I don't see it. That's what Genesis 1 is, that founding and fundamental say that the natural order is good because God, God says it's good. And the narrative shows you what order means. Seven days. And then you celebrate the six days on the seventh day. You celebrate the order. You bless God for the order of life that you didn't create. When God said, let there be light, let there be fish, let there be a sun, and then God said it's good. So notice two things. Notice the counterpoint of language, of the subversion, and notice the difference in narrative form or literary form. Right? Genesis 1 (coughs) is structured and symmetrical and orderly. It is what it proposes to be, God's good world. It's saying, look at the world and see its structure and order and thank God. That's the world that you want to accommodate, to fit into. It's already there. The text is telling you so. The Bible tells you so. Right? I don't, I don't see it. Damn the day. And so he speaks in this jerky, halting screech. Damn, damn, damn. Night, night, night. Stillbirth. Death. My mother is my tomb. Who talks that way? Who in their right mind talks that way? You keep saying saying damn the day. Uh, Is there a sense that like this particular text is is using obscenities in some way to really push that? No, I'm I'm just being rhetorical. Okay. But he says Yovad. Okay. But he's cursing because he says he curses the day. Um Damn is the ultimate curse. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just trying to kind of, it's more rhetorical, but when he says he's cursing the day, and there's an overtone in the language of Vayikalel, of cursing, that he, may, he trivializes the day. Kal means light, it's trivial. The cursing is a trivialization of the signification of day, isn't it? Right? Right? In other words, everything in the semiotics of Genesis 1 is to introduce signification into life. Right? And that this God blesses it. Right? And it's told. It's good. And everything now is anti-signification. Yovad, let it, let it be nothing. Let it be blotted out. Let it be over. So there is, at this first hermeneutical level, we're trying to get at this. We're trying to see that it's the terminology and it's the literary form, right? So 
so the question that's gnawing is well you at the very first class we were talking about you know foundationalism so what's the foundation so some certain Christian theologians talk about foundationalism they'll say well the order of life has foundations there's a order to existence, to nature, it's good, right? I can depend on it. God has implanted an order there, right? That's a, that's a foundation, right? A foundation might be hope and expectation of the good, right? That there's something built into the order of things that's the good. God calls it the good, but the theologian says that the good then is there. God is simply saying that this is good. I can count on it. I can do things and they will be sustained. My actions have a viability. That's foundationalism, isn't it? Right? that I can do a moral action and it, it, has, it, it, it has something to it, right? A moral action has something to it. If I lie and I cheat and I don't do a moral action, it's like, it's vapor, it doesn't, it's not really there. The real actions are moral actions because they're grounded in God's universe, right? If we just talk about the natural theological order, talk about the revelation of the Ten Commandments, and you say there's another aspect of you can. That's a foundation, right? But where is the foundation here? What's the foundation? In this world of anxiety, you see what he's undermining. Your use of your use of the word "damn" for me was, I was it was rather compelling in the sense that I feel like um, Job is where the day of birth is seen as kind of the paramount, not paramount, kind of this exciting moment of the the um, the beginning of life. It seems like he's wanting to paint it essentially as like Sheol or this. We'll, we'll come, we'll come, yeah, we'll come to that second half. Okay. But, but notice, but, but you notice how that first line is. Um, when the child is born, they say, it's a boy. It's a child. Right? Birth. And he is now personifying that as the day saying that. The day says, Right? It's not that it was evening this morning and the first day. Now the day says this. And he says, I wish that the day had no voice. Right? I wish the day had no voice. And before we jump to that second half, just so you can see the other side, two other aspects when we talk about the biblical hermeneutics of the specificity. So if you have your uh, Bibles, just, um, just jump to chapter 20 of jo- uh, Jeremiah, the text that I was alluding to a second ago. And I just want to... So he asks, he says to God, you seduce me. You seduced me to become a speaker of your word and you tricked me because you told me at the beginning that I'll be a protector of you. You're no protector. Everybody curses me and I'm filled with pain. You said I'll be a wall of bronze to you. And he uses this language of rape in verse 7. You seduced me and grabbed me. It's the language of rape in the law. You just filled me with your word. You impregnated me with hope. 
and I became a laughing stock all the day. You said you would protect me. Hello? Everybody mocks me. Whenever I speak, they turn me into pain. So I said I won't speak anymore, right? But it's, your word is overwhelming. You've been impregnated me with your word and it just bursts out like fire in my belly. I can't, I can't contain it. So what can you do? In verse 14. Cursed is the day that I was born. Right? Because God had said to him, why does he do this? <coughs> because God had said to Jeremiah in chapter 1, before you were born, I sanctified you to be my messenger. You were already sanctified in the womb of your mother to be my messenger. And he's saying, I wish I was dead in that place. Right? The biblical hermeneutics, we're looking at another form of self-curse of dying in the womb. But we're trying to get a sense of the specificity of Job's language by some other kind of parallel. Cursed is the day that I was born. The day that my mother gave birth to me, may it not be blessed. That it may not be yehi baruch, let it not be blessed. Let there no be blessing. No blessing. No blessing. Cursed is the person who gave greetings to my father and said, Whoa! You have a son. Right? Let's rejoice. Cursed is a person. May that person just be turned into a dung heap. I wish I died in the womb. That my mother's body was my grave. You see, there's a kind of shared semiotics with the language that's emerging in Job. And that her rechem, her womb, her place of compassion was my eternal death. That I never came out of there. I never came out of a space as a, he's punning on rechem as womb and a place of maternal compassion, right? There's a pun on that. That there is no to see amal, to see the labor of life and suffering, and that I was wiped out from the beginning. Now, whether one hears that underlying Job or one makes a comparison, the value of the comparison is to help you see how deep and different Job's cursing is. Jeremiah is just talking about shame. Right? He's talking about the fact that God had promised him some form of protection and God let him down. God's no friend, like he said. He's no guiding, protecting hand. So I've been shamed and laughed at and mocked. Right? So that's an expression of the inability to endure shame. That's different from Job. You can see comparatively how deep this is. 
right? It's the pain of all the death, and all the sorrow. It's not the shame that he feels. It's what he has internalized of the horror of life as he sees it. It's different. So from a biblical hermeneutic point of view, if we make a comparison, something of that difference comes to our mind. And then the third, so that's another case of this use of amal, where it's a sign not of the burden of life, but of bearing the burden of mockery. Right? And the third kind of case appears frequently in Ecclesiastes. In chapter 3, for example, and elsewhere, he uses the word amal. But Ecclesiastes, who also sees into the horror of life and its and to what seems to be meaningless to his gaze, but he speaks the language of a kind of speculative reflection. It's the mind and the eye that's looking. I saw this and I saw that and I watched this happen and I watched that happen and it's all, it's all crap. I see this and I see this and I see this and it's all, everybody dies. This, people aren't different from animals. You accumulate things and you don't enjoy them. It's worthless. But that's that's the speculative gaze. Right? So that's also different from a comparative biblical hermeneutical point of view. It's sharpening this too. This is not the speculative gaze. I saw people do look for wisdom. Then I saw people just going to bars. And their life is the same. So what's the what's what's the what's right? But that's a kind of reflection where he's trying to say, um, what can I do? What seems to have the best effect? Right? Nothing has an effect. It's all the same. Death is the end, and it doesn't seem to make any difference how you lived. But he's looking at this from the eye, the visual eye that's looking on the world making judgments. That's different from the internal feeling of joy. So again, from the biblical hermeneutical point of view, Ecclesiastes is closer to philosophical theology. He's not, it's not abstract. But he's close to that because he's speaking the speech. He's talking the talk. He's not feeling the feeling. Right? So we're trying to sense that. So if, with that thought in mind, then we come back to the second half of this Job passage. Someone read from 14 to 26, verse 14 to 26. So now we see this second if I was dead, so he says, if I was dead, I wouldn't have any more anxiety. He'd be quiet. <clears throat> and now he's going to talk about what's going on in Sheol, what's going on in the netherworld. Right? <clears throat> Marie? Okay. With the world's kings and counselors who rebuild ruins for themselves, or with nobles who possess gold and who fill their houses with silver. Or why was I not like a buried stillbird, like babies who never saw the light? Yeah, if, if, if stillborn. If, 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 why was I not buried stillborn? Yeah. Uh, there the wicked cease from troubling. Rogues, and, rogues, that's the term. There there's no rogues, there's no anxiety, there's no tremor, there's no tremendum. Rogues, we'll see, so I can say that at the very end. It's one of his deep terms of angwaz, right? 
turmoil of pain. Yeah, keep going. There rest those whose strength is spent. Prisoners are wholly at ease. They do not hear the taskmaster's voice. Small and gray alike are there. And the slave is free of his master. Why does he give light to the sufferer? And the amal, to the person who lives with amal. Right? Why does he give that kind of... What's give light to that kind of... Okay? And life to the bitter in spirit. To those who wait for death, but it does not come. Who search for it more than for treasure, who rejoice to exaltation and are glad to reach the grave. To the man who has lost his way, whom God has hedged about. Can you hear here the allusion to the Satan? Right? He says that, that God has hedged around. That's what Satan had said to God. You hedged him about. Right? It's the exact same language. You hedge things about and you protect him. Right? Yeah. That the biblical hermeneutics, he's playing off of that. He's playing off of that. Go on. My groaning serves as my bread. My roaring pours forth as water. For what I feared has overtaken me. What I dreaded has come upon me. I had no repose, no quiet, no rest. And trouble came. Right. So here in verse 25 we see this strong, now, eruption of the anxiety that had been felt earlier, that we had been talking about, right? He said that you had already posed, that was posed, you know, from the very beginning of his ritual life. And now we're seeing that this deeper, deeper consciousness that's now he's getting in touch with. What I was really afraid of, what I was really, really afraid of, that it just makes no sense, has come upon me. Right? These rituals I've shored against my ruins, he said, right? <laughs> These rituals I've shored against my ruins. And now I see it's a ruin. I was afraid. Right? That which I fear has come. So now look at the, the power of these metaphors. The fear and the anxiety has come. What I feared most, another term, but here the term is the term that it all appears in Jeremiah, Yavoli. So I want you to feel that term, Yavo, that it comes. The sense of the happening, right? The happening, the coming upon, right? The full force of Yavoli, the happening. In other words, I built a life of ritual hoping that it matched Genesis 1. Right? Right? That was my hope. God said, do these rituals. And you'll be part of the order of things. Maybe because I saw people die before, but I didn't really, something was gnawing at me, right? Maybe because I saw people die, I knew that there was suffering, I know that plants don't always grow. I know that bodies revolt against and they become sick. I had seen a little of this, but it was on the margin, right? So I could keep it under control. I kept it under control. But it was simmering. Simmering, simmering. That the order, the good order, had some flaws. And 
I, people would say to me, okay, so there's all the seeds and there are this, all this remarkable organic biology and sometimes it gets messed up and this carcinogens and this and that and some bodies get messed up. But over the long haul, look at the incredible thing about the body, right? About the earth. So, I said Genesis 1 makes the sense. It's all in order. Okay? And, but I had a little anxiety, but I was able to factor it out. Because <coughs> most bodies seem to work. And most of the time, things are going well. Or you say that this overtakes you in old age. Right? Or if you're hungry, maybe they didn't plant Right, or they screwed up the earth. Right, or there was ethnic hatred and this and that, but that's just people messing up God's good order. Right, because God's good order is Genesis 1. Right, so I'm really, that's the foundation of things. All this other stuff is people screwing it up, or occasionally. People have a drink, and then their kids are born this way. So it's your fault. It's not God's fault. Don't drink and don't take drugs, and you won't have kids with deformities, right? That kind of stuff. But something was bothering me. So something was bothering me. Is that real? You know? And then... What I, so I thought that there was a match between my ritual and the the order of things. And I built a whole theology on that match. Now I see there's a different match. Right? That what I just experienced, what I was afraid of, that those things that I thought were interlocking don't always connect. And that that's the truth of things, he says, now that I'm experiencing it. That he's thinking out of his experience. He may not... So he, don't look at it. That's also true. He's, think, he's making this assessment out of his experience. He's one person, but that's the power of this text. He's making this assessment out of his experience. He's trying to say, you're just a sample of one, Job. You know, shove it. Right? Widen your sample, and you see it's a good order. But he's saying... He's putting it all all the chips on this moment. And he's saying, the match now is between all that I had as anxiety and what the world what goes on in the world. I am old. It just happens crazy. Someone dies, a storm, a flood, the Sabians come, the winds come. Why? God decides to send the Sabians, and God decides to send the wind, and decides to send cancer. Wow. So there's no connection, you see. Right? It's a different match. Right? Like, these two matches are not adding up, he's saying. So he said, what I was afraid of has happened. They're happening. Can you feel? That's part of this anxiety that he's talking about. Can you, not just all the death, can you internalize the happening of happenings? Things just happen. It hits the fan. It just happens. Stuff happens. Right? Stuff happens. You fill in the stuff. Right? I'm just in the last sentence, then you have a question again. So now he links back to verse 13 in verse 26 when he ends. So I had no rest. If I wished, I wish that. I was dead and I would have rest, but I had no rest. I had no quiet. I had no solace. All the terms of verse 13 are now repeated in verse 26. Vayavo roges. That 
term that he had just used earlier. And Rogez happens. Right? So Rogez now becomes not just an abstract term. It is this eruption of something true. Rogez is something. It's not that the world is tov. It's good. There's Rogez. Instability. And confusion subjectified as anxiety turmoil. Okay? It's an incredible thing. Rogues happens. Thus, Rogues happens, and what was deep in my consciousness is now I see that that's what it is. Right? Now, there's a new match between the inner world and the outer world. So let me have some responses, and then we'll do something a little bit different towards the end. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, when we used to draw in, in the prologue, we hear that he has, he's a God fearer. He fears God. Right. But, but then underneath that, it seems there's this other fear that that is not the fear of God, that he says um, these things are happening, that the things he has feared all along are happening. And I was wondering how that plays out with what Otto talks about, the, the, um, the creature with consciousness. Okay, um, okay. Um, um, yeah, I, so let me make two points, at least the way I understand it. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, am, I think that when Joe, when the narrative says that he is Yorei Elohim, he is referring not to fear, but a reverential sense. Because that use of Yorei has a theological charge, which is different from Pacha, fear, anxiety, or rogues. So it's not a term of fear of God, in the sense of God's overwhelmingness, but it's a reverential disposition. Um, for, for Otto, that disposition creates the creature consciousness of humility. It's that consciousness that would allow a Job to say, God has given and God has taken away. In other words, it's a feature not yet expressed, perhaps still an uncharted theological orientation. But when death strikes, his larger sense of divine reverence allows him to capture a creature consciousness that I have no right to expect more. That is the deep humility that I have as creature. I'm just mortal, and I have to be grateful for the little life that was given to me. Right? And I say, thank God, bless God, right? for that, that I had a little life, and I had a little time with my kids. Right? And I had a little time with my rituals. Thank God for that. It's not nothing. And I see it in perspective. Okay? That, I think, is very different from the abyss into which he is now. Um, the notion of his sense of creaturehood is now talking about the fragmentation of consciousness and existence. Right? That's a different fragmented consciousness. And I think that that is very different than the kind... Now whether that is humility is something we have to explore. I would 
want to argue or I want to suggest, and over the course of the rest of the chapters, that this is the regrounding of humility. Right? In other words, it's a regrounding in this need to rebuild a universe piece by piece. It's, not, it's deeper than that first level of creaturely awareness, I think. It becomes an awareness of the huge gaps in existence. Right? It's an awareness of the, of the gaps. This sense of the tremendum is a sense that there is a vast divine order and I have to see my place in it, which is very limited. I come from a mother's womb and I decay in the ground. I have things and I lose things. That, that's part of what it means to be a creature. I think that in this case, the humility is deeper. Right? It's the humility that is coming close to the humus, the kind of the coming to the earth, the gaps. It's coming to the gaps, filling the gaps with a responsible life and being able to see things again through the gaps. I think that's going to be part of what... It's going to take a long time to get there. But I think that's going to be part of the ultimate way that God's going to instruct Job to see the world again at the end. But I want to wait till we get there. We still have seven or eight weeks to go until we get there. (laughs) And it takes time. Um, And so it's this first moment of wanting to really erase the pain and then rebuilding from that space. Right? So if I now within the framework of Rogis, right? Within the framework that that anxiety is me and has overtaken me, what kind of a life can I build? It's a different standpoint of humility, I think, than the standpoint of simple creature reverence. Reverence, I think. For me, it is, in any case. Um, It does not necessarily mean that there is no foundational order to things. Right? But I have had a profound experience of the gaps. Whether there is a foundationalism of some sort, that's going to have to be sorted out. Because we're still, we're not yet in any space of revelation. But there is a new perception of gaps, of anxiety of disconnections, of vayavoli. It just happens to me. Right? That the anxiety of possibility is true. That's a deeper truth. Right? Now whether the self can recover and say, thank God for the rhythm and the order and life, that's, we're, not, we're not there yet. And it may not be for any, for all of us, or, for, or all the time, right? But that's still, that's still somewhere else. I do think that God is going, to, in, the, in the narrative, at the end, he's going to give a different vision of creation than Genesis 1. Then, and then, and then I'll hear your question. 
Then the harder question for a person who has Genesis 1 with one hand and Job 38 and following with the other hand, can you live with both? Um, so I have a question about anxiety as a way of knowing that what you just said triggered. So I was really troubled by the Johnson commentary this week because he um, sort of immediately moves into a space of redemptive suffering to kind of connect with what Elijah said earlier. Um, he finds redemption in the suffering that Job is experiencing as of chapter 3 in what he calls a heightened way of knowing or a heightened um, perceptual or sensory awareness. So for Jansen, Job was in a dogmatic slumber in the first two chapters, and now that all of the creature comforts are gone, he perceives things more vividly. I have problems with that reading. I, I think it's overly simple. I don't think that Job is in dogmatic slumber um, in the first two chapters. And I don't, I think that it's um, overly simple to say that in chapter three, Job has a privileged way of knowing because um, everything has broken down for him. Language is breaking down. Um, connections to the world are breaking down, which is why I really appreciated the Philip Nemo book because he talks about anxiety as a sort of broken way of knowing. But I hear you saying that Anxiety is a, a privileged way of knowing in that it comes to shed light on the gaps. Um, it reveals the limitations of the sort of Genesis 1 account of reality. And so I guess my question is, what's the relationship between the moment of everything breaking down, communication, um, connecting to people, trying to put on a smiling face and being unable to do so, what's the connection between that moment and the space where one can, between that, that sort of um, epistemic state of anxiety and the space where one can more properly build um, um, a sort of better, more responsible account of the order of things given the gaps that one has seen? Question yeah, I, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it just... I'm still working at it. <laughs> so I, it's a lifetime project. It, it's not like... I think part of what you're rejecting in Jansen is he went too fast to the end. He went too fast. Um, and so I'm saying... You can't go too fast, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes you see better than others. Um, but you, what, what, what breaks down at a certain point is having one answer that fits all situations, right? Like the big answer is no longer possible. It's constantly gesturing and finding resources in this book, that tradition, this person to build up the universe and so on. It's, a, it's, it's slow, right? So I don't think... Um, so I have no answer for you. It's just doing it with your eyes open somehow I don't, and, um, and not forgetting the resources of the traditions that's also there right um, how those resources are used may not always be helpful as the friends will be saying to Job they're using the resources he says yeah, doesn't work doesn't make sense it's not me it's not me, right? You've got a big solution that you're applying. It's not me. So, um, um, 
And I think still in chapter 3, it's... I talk to the other side that you sort of see into the gaps, but in this chapter he's, he's just flooded with this pain. Right? Um, I think, and that's the issue of what do you do with that so that you never forget that. But if that's the whole thing, you can't live a life. Right? So, from chapter 3 on, you, have to, you try to build a life. But if this is the new consciousness, not the end of the task, because you still want to get married and have kids maybe, and do things and feel that it has some value, some foundation, right? It's somehow there and it's part of the good create it's part those pieces of the good creation there that are there so how do you do it right in other words it's not, it's not going to be somehow the pieces of Genesis 1 are flying all over the place and how do you now create a new magnetic center to kind of hold these things like filings of a uh, magnet where you try to, it's not like that that's, those things are not true. There are wonderful blessings and order and this and that. And yet, like, how do those pieces now come in? So you keep, so you keep moving around and you're this like, kind of magnet, all these little metal fightings keep moving around as you keep changing. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I don't have any special privilege knowledge. I've just been trying to do it longer than you, that's all. <laughs> Um, so that's I think and we have to see how Job can be helpful you, you know you may come to the end of it and say that this is just not a helpful book I think it's a very helpful book but it, you may say it's not helpful or only helps under these circumstances you know and then you just have to be honest am I saying it's not working because I just can't let go of the notion of redemptive suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I can't let go of it. Right? Um, so, it's not a question of whether you can let it go, can you bracket it for a few, for a few more weeks? <laughs> right? When you go to church on Sunday, you may want to pull it back into your head, because it may really work for lots of other liturgical reasons. And, but, this is opening up something bigger than Sunday or Saturday, right? That's, and that's part of that. Um, um, so let me make one more point then, because we're coming up to time. Um, I jotted down in some notes here, coming back to this issue of biblical hermeneutics that we're coming back to now again, and talking about Job in a phenomenology of experience. Now, in your English translation of Nemo, he said that it's a um, some kind of a super phenomenology. What does he say? It's a rigorous the book of Job contains a rigorous phenomenology of anxiety. And then the French says, he says, un phénoménologie de l'angoisse, it's a phenomenology, but un, it's a meticulous description of anxiety. That's something else. Right? A meticulous description of anxiety such that its appearance transforms l'apparence de tout le reste. It transforms everything else that I ex experience. It's a totally different statement. It's a description of anxiety the like of which transforms Job's relationship to everything else. 
He can't, ha- he can't think future. He only thinks present. He doesn't think hope. He thinks now. He doesn't think solution. He thinks anxiety. He feels anxiety. The structure of the world is now this thing. He has no all. It has transformed the way everything is seen. He's not yet able to rebuild a narrative. So, the phrase that I would leave you with at this point, as we're closing in on the end, is I think that part of where we've been moving is a is there's a stripping, there's a strip, a mental and physical stripping. There's a stripping. which has the quality of divestment, letting go. The first part, the stripping, has the theological quality of letting go, divestment. I can let it go. But there's a deeper stripping that's taking place in Job. So it's a stripping um, that strips formulations away, that turns language into a series of vocal gasps that turns roges and amal into the center of consciousness. So that the world is seen from within that space. There's no outer world. That world, that is, that's what, and Nemo says, that's what evil is. Maybe it's not the best, only definition, but he says evil is when some self-evidence of the world breaks down and I only see something else, these gaps. Through the anxiety that by a vote, it could just happen to me. It could just happen to me. If you're driving your car and also something, goon. Swerves in front of you, I, I could have just, it could have been done. Right? It just could happen. It just could happen like that. Is God behind that? It just could happen. He was, she was selfful and I was doing it, that. It just could happen. Is, the, right? is, is, the, is Satan saying, do this to test fish bait? Right? It's a different consciousness. So, where does that fit into this larger theological thing? It could just happen. Just like that. You hope for a child, and then, oh, look at this boy. And you live with it. It just happens. It just happens. Yeah. You spend all of your time taking care, and then all of a sudden, to go off the deep end. It just happens. There's something there that, so there's a stripping away, right? So when we get to the end of chapter three in the stripping, we have to say, so all of a sudden, Eliphaz will, can't stand it, so he, he jumps in. And then we have to kind of think through, how does biblical hermeneutics Try to staunch. Stick fingers in. How many fingers? How many places can you stick your fingers into the holes? Okay. So we'll come to that next week. All right. (laughs)